It's more, what we try and teach is that you're having, having bullets in your belt, right? Okay, ways that we can attack different situations that we run across. And the more tools you have available to you, the better off you are. Jim, are you good with audio? Okay, perfect. Um, so, here's another tool, all right? I, some of you have, have, have been this, uh, to this before. When you, we teach a lot of traffic generating events, right? Mid in 100K, we're talking about getting in front of people. Get face to face, eyeball to eyeball with people, you're gonna win. Just as soon as you get, and you can actually shake somebody's hand and look them in the eye, all right? You've got a, about an 85% chance of winning compared to having a great website. As much as great websites are great, all right? Eyeball to eyeball beats pixel to eyeball every day of the week, all right? It, it absolutely will. So when you're there though, you need to have a skill set ready to try and attack all these different types of buyers. So first time home buyers, we got all these down payment assistance programs. We got uh, people with credit challenges. The doctor walks in and says, I'm a doctor. And you immediately think, your credit blows, all right? Okay, <laughs> because it's, the odds are, all right? <laughs> I'm just telling you. Um, any doctors in the room? <laughs> all right, good. All right, you can self-attest to that, all right? And some of them can't. Um, that being said, uh, so you want to have something like the Home Partners of America, you know, for that group. Uh, last Tuesday after our office meeting, and that's up already, Jim, is that one up? on FHR University, that was the renovation loans. You remember, we all have heard of 203K programs for FHA, right, where they can borrow more money to fix up the property. Now, but Fannie Mae says, hey, look, we don't like to lose business, so Fannie now has a product that's similar to that, all right? And um, somebody from, uh, you'll help me out here, I know her name. She did a great job. Uh, uh, Francine Villa, all right, uh, uh, led us uh, on a discussion about the different types of renovation uh, loans that are out there. Because right now, you meet a first time home buyer, especially somebody that needs to go FHA or really low down payment, they've got, oh, I can you know, roll my nickels and I'll get my 3.5% of $140,000, but I don't have the extra $20,000 to put appliances and you know cabinets that aren't falling apart you see the pictures who posted those pictures of the new cabinets they went and got say oh, yeah. that I think it's Fran yeah. was that Frances I think or somebody that posted the brand new cabinet or great cabinets custom cabinets they walked in they're like trash you know it's like hello uh, I guess customs in the eye of the beholder right it's right. Um, so uh, but now they need to do all the stuff but they don't have the money to do that right but everything that's in their price range because they're first time home buyer right now especially it's trashed, mm -hmm. right? So how do we work on that? How do we, you know, finagle that? You always get that question. Hey, how can I ever borrow more money than what I'm, you know, what the house is so I can roll all of this in? Well, there's, so you want to have an avenue for that, right? Um, Chris mentioned some uh, uh, credit repair people. I think that should be a, a person on your team, right? We call those crockpot buyers. All right, we're going to put them in the slow cooker, right? Okay, well, you sit here. You come, we'll come back in six months see how you're doing, right? But we don't want to lose touch of those people, right? Because you don't want to, hey, I met you six months ago. Oh, yeah, well, I went to another open house yesterday, and now it's six months down the road, and I met somebody, and they, I'm ready to go, and I happen to go buy a home with them, right? You want to stay in touch so, so you don't just ignore the crock pot. I, a joke that I do sometimes. It's kind of nice. Do you ever really make meals in crockpots? <laughs> yeah. oh, awesome, man. You put it in the morning. You come back and it smells great and all day long. And it's, it's awesome, right? Okay? You have to stand over and slave over. So that kind of buyer is, you want to have, a, have an avenue for that. Another type of buyer you're going to run into is an investor. Now, um, if you came to learn about the buy and flip seminar, you're in the wrong room. All right? Well, you're in the right room. You ready for that seminar? Okay, here we go. Buy low, sell high. All right? <laughs> Done. Okay? Well, well, we'll borrow. Buy low, put lipstick on a pig, sell high. All right? Okay, that's what a buy and flip scenario is. The trick on all that, we all know, is buying low. Book right? for sale in the okay. lobby. What's that? Book for sale in the lobby. There you go. Okay? It's just hard to find those deals and so on and so forth. So this is not Ron Legrand. This is not... You know, I'm not rolling through selling my $3,000, you know, program. They're all going to take a bus tour and show you how we could go buy properties today, right? None of that, all right? This is speaking to the language of a person that is looking for a long-term investment, right? Longer term, what we call buy and hold investors, right? People are going to buy a property, hold it for a while, lease it out, get some return on investment, that kind of thing, maybe resell it. All right, they've read Robert Kiyosaki's purple books in the store, all right, rich dad, poor dad, and they're going to later on down the road, they're going to sweep off green, four green houses and replace it with one red hotel. All right, that's the whole idea. Now, you're going to meet investors that know how to do that. And when you know how to do that and you actually speak their language, they're going to fall in love with you. 
They literally will because 99.8% of realtors out there have no idea how to do this. This is the stuff and the, who's recently licensed, right? Okay, just passed the test how long ago? Uh, about a month ago. About a month ago, okay, passed his test. So he's probably a little ahead of you because, well, maybe not. Do you guys remember back in the day when you're passing your test and your first question you asked was, what? how many math questions? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so, so if I got all those wrong, can I still pass, right? Yeah, you guys, I, I can see it, I know you guys, right? Okay, that, that group, we're gonna revisit that math, all right? The Irv Triangle is gonna come back to haunt you big time right now, okay? All right, but I'm gonna do it in a way that I'm gonna teach you, and I'm really good. I was a really good math teacher, I still am a really good math teacher. We're gonna go with the mantra that this is simple, I got, I got this, right? Those of you non-100Kers, that's what we talk. All right, this is simple, I got this, right? So that's how we're attacking this. And, but I'm telling you, so you're gonna run across those investors who are gonna fall in love with you, and you're gonna run across some people that maybe not, not know today that they, are an investor, but might consider it based upon your explanation of how a potential, right, because we make, where's my buddy, we make no guarantees, right, okay, <laughs> no guarantees, we make no guarantees, but we say, hey, look, here's what might happen, right, if we bought this and we had this kind of, you know, uh, rate of return. Here's some numbers, all right, and, and it looks good, all right, so everybody with me so far? Buy and hold, this is what we're going to talk to them about. And by the way, it becomes really a lot of fun. And guess what? At the end of the day, you're going to talk yourself into being one of these investors. All right? I'm a firm believer that real estate agents ought to be the largest holder of investment real estate. Mm -hmm. We know the numbers. All right? We can pay ourselves to do our business. Chris paid himself to buy his you know, home and so on and so forth. If nothing else, you have that license to get, at least get your stinking class fees and your first year of you know board dues back by buying a home on your own all right at least re reimburse yourself that if nothing else right and and do a deal all right so here we go here's the thing i'm going to calculate a cap rate okay here is you guys heard me you guys heard that term before mm -hmm. okay cap rate is short for capitalization rate it is what investors want to hear that's the thing where if you do say, hey, look, by the way, oh, you're an investor. You know, I run some numbers on a, on a uh, you know, triplex just on the other side, uh, other side of town here a little bit. And you know what? I don't know why it's not, people aren't jumping at it, but based upon what I'm seeing, you're probably looking at a 10 to 10.8% 10 cap. Right? Now, if you do that at an open house, carry smelling salts because you're going to have to wake that person up if they're true an investor. All right? And they're gonna, when you wake them up with smelling salts, they're going to say, what? I said, I thought you were a realtor. I am a realtor. But you said cap rate. And you explained it, all right? You, no realtors I know know how to do that because most realtors don't because they were too busy checking out a class because they said I can miss all the class, I can miss all those questions and still pass, all right? So we're gonna learn how to do that. Cap rate, here's all it is. Cap rate is used to back into a value, all right? We don't care. Take, take your whole concept of traditional um, uh, CMA, all right, as far as doing an analysis of what a mark, what a, take it, the, your traditional concept that you use in single family property, you know, a residential property, toss it out the window. All right, we're gonna talk about how we're gonna evaluate these things, but it is not based upon what the home across the street or same zip code or three streets over or whatever sold for. It has nothing to do with it, all right? It's all about cap rate. The logic is we're gonna create a value based on the cash flow that the property creates along with the desired rate of return from the investor. Let me just give you an example. So, um, people, in, repeat after me. Investors do not, Investors do not buy, homes. buy homes. They buy, they buy cash, flow. cash flow. Got it? That's all they're buying, right? is how much are you willing to pay me for this thing, happens to be a triplex, all right, that spits out 12 grand a year positive cash flow. How much are you willing to pay me, right? That's all you're gonna have the discussion about. The key is how do we get to that bottom line, make sure it's verifiable that it does spit out $12,000 a year, all right? And then if the investor says, let me just give you a 300 or a 30,000 foot view and then we're gonna go down to, you know, about a 300 foot view, but let's start at 30,000 foot. Let's say an investor says, you know what? I'm getting terrible returns and I would just leave. If you can get me a 10%, a cap rate of 10, of 10, all right? Then you say, okay, I can prove to you this thing, happens to be a triplex, spits out 12 grand a year. So in my mind, that says that investor should be willing to pay $120,000 for that thing. 
-hmm. Are you with me? Because mm -hmm. they're looking for 10% rate of return. 120,000, they take 120,000 out of their bank account, put it in, all right, and every year it returns $12,000. That's the cash flow, right? That is, easy enough, right? A 10% rate of return, are you with me? Okay. Whole idea, all right, that's as simple as it. I told you this is simple, mm -hmm. all right? Boy, I wish you would've taught my real estate class, Bob. Well, you're right, you're right, all right? Buy and hold investors are not purchasing property, they're purchasing a the cash flow. I got ahead of my bullet point, all right? If you get nothing else out of this class than that, just understand they are not buying a property, they're buying a cash flow, all right? I kind of, you guys seen those J.G. Wentworth commercials, <laughs> right? Oh, oh. Guy with the big horns, he's on the bus and, you know. <laughs> if you have a fixed annuity and you need cash now. Right, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no. Okay, you gotta go see it, man. I, I, we, we don't have enough time, I'd put it up there for you. All right, okay, thank you. All right, okay, if you, that's what they're doing, right? When they do that, you got some fixed annuity, you went and saw Fran Hash, all right? Is she the chick on the Sarah? billboards? She's the chick. What's the Fran. No, I'm talking about Fran, the, the, the lawyer, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Right. So you got somebody, and you talk to somebody. You know, somebody says, "Forget it." They don't. You know, they don't. The, the, the lawsuit has no merit, but it's easier to pay them off, yeah. right? So they decide to pay you eight thousand dollars a year for the next ten years. All right, to get you off their back or whatever. Okay. So you get sue somebody, and you get. So they have this annuity, right, coming in. But you say, hey, you know what? Eight grand a year is great, but I'm just, man, I got to, I'm just itching for a Vegas trip and it's going to cost me more than eight grand, all right? So instead of eight grand for 10 years, that's 10, 000, that's 80,000 bucks. But man, if somebody will pay me 60 grand now, I'll take it, all right? 60 grand. So they, that's what J.G. Wentworth does. They go in and they'll buy your annuity. Hey, I'm going to buy the rights to your eight grand a year, but I'm not going to pay you 80, right? I'm gonna pay you less because current value of money and so on and so forth, right? That's all investors are looking to buy, is a cash flow. That's what JG and Wentworth is looking to buy, that eight grand a year cash flow. Chuck. It complicates the ROI or the cap rate yep. a little bit if they're not a cash buyer. Oh, it does, well, okay, but however, our value, and we're gonna discuss that because that's when we get down to 300 feet, we're, uh, the idea, it, 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 it affects the ROI but it does not affect the cap rate, and I'll show you why, okay? Because cap rate does not take into consideration, all right, debt service, all right? And we're going to talk about that when we get there, because it assumes cash. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two evaluations we're going to do for an investor. We're going to evaluate cap rate from an all-cash perspective, and most investors are smart, and even though they have the cash, and say, hey, look, if I have 120000 to put into that, but I can, there's a lender out there willing to lend me at 80 20 or 80 percent LTV instead of me buying one triplex let's go buy five mm -hmm. right with the same amount of cash outlay because of leverage mm -hmm. so we want to analyze that as well and we'll, we'll teach you how to do that all right but it's a very valid point all right and Chuck hit the nail on the head that uh, we have to consider if we're going to do ROI um, uh, analysis which we will that return on investment, right? That we do have to in, uh, consider what our debt service is. And ROI is kind of like cap rate. Right? It kind of is, all right, but ROI is really what my return is based upon the money I put in, mm -hmm. all right? And we'll get there. Cap rate is what's my return or what am I willing to pay? It's, it's a way of actually backing into a price because we're going to learn that the same cash flow, right? It's the same calculation, just gives you an answer on one end and an answer on the other. That's correct. Let's take a look at it. All right? All right? Let's, let's go to the board. All right? So that's the 30,000 uh, foot view. Got, got that whole generalized idea? Right? Yeah? Leslie, you got this. the eighth time you've been here, and you've got it now. <laughs> All right? Come on. I'm looking at a page that has 2014. Yeah, I love it. Okay? All right, we're going to drive it into you one way or another. We're going to get it. All right. So here's an example. I love uh, teaching through examples, right? Because it kind of puts some numbers to it and we kind of get some reality, all right? And this is fairly true. We can, here's the beauty of the example is that I'm going to share a triplex in anywhere Florida, all right? The cool thing is the formula we're going to use to do this for this triplex could be used for a 40-unit apartment complex in, in you know, uh, Northeast St. Pete. And it could be used for a Class A right commercial space next to the international plaza all right it's all of it the formulas don't change all right the numbers get bigger there might be a few more details in a class a office space you know that uh, that the triplex in holiday florida doesn't have 
right? But the reality is the logic and the concept behind it is all the same. And so if we can do it in a very simplified version, you can expand that to affect or work with anything you do, all right? So here it is. We're gonna do this tri triplex in anywhere floor. This is just the raw data. Here's, what, here's our raw data that we could ideally go to the MLS and get, all right? Here's the other thing. 99% of the people who are listing these types of investment properties, all right, have no clue how to list them, all right? Because what you need to properly analyze a property, all right, for an investor, or if you're gonna look to invest yourself, is not in the MLS, unfortunately, all right? So you have to dig to get this. Now the fields are there, right? They could put all the data in, unfortunately they don't because they aren't thinking like an investor and they're actually doing a very poor job of representing their seller. All right, to do this. By the way, um, take a look at this and, and pictures all you want. That's great. If you, uh, when we, uh, we'll put this up on FHR University. And then in addition to that, <clears throat> we can't put the slides, I don't think, there because it has to be a PDF. Just email me. If you want a copy of the PowerPoint, just email me and I can get you a copy. Can we put them up there? I can make a video. Okay. All right, so we'll even put the PDF below the uh, uh, when class. When you look on the investment part on MLS, it does, a lot of them do say, Cap rate, or they, yeah, okay, uh, that's, and that's Can true. You go off of that? Well, it's based upon their information. We're gonna talk about that, right? Is that, you know, realize that the people, because remember, we're an, an investor that we're representing is buying a cash flow, right? And by the way, if you're representing somebody that's listing a property like this, you know that the people, but the buyers are buying a cash flow. Now remember that every, every piece of property, every cash flow for that matter, has truly three sets of books. Right? There's the set of books that they're going to show the IRS that says, oh, you made no money. <laughs> it's all gone. You kidding? This thing's like just uh, leaking like a sieve, man. You kidding? I don't know how to do with it. I gotta, you know, that's what they're going to tell the IRS. Right? <laughs> then there's a set of books that they want to show you when you're looking to buy. Oh, man, it's just raining dollars, man. I'm just telling you, I just got to carry a big enough bucket to catch it all, right? So that's the thing that they're going to show you. And it's probably somewhere in the middle is the truth, yeah. right? And so you got to verify this stuff. I'm not saying just take what they're saying at face value. Somebody, who is it that bought, was it you? Have an investor, okay? Mm -hmm. I say, hey, get a copy of those leases ASAP. Because mm -hmm. you want to take a look at the lease. Just because they say they're getting X amount of dollars, I want to see the lease. Mm -hmm. I want to see how long they are, all right? Because sometimes when you're buying these properties, you're buying them and they're under leased, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? So that's cool. And you can tell your investor, hey, look, they're only getting 600 bucks a month right now, but it's, we've got to ride this out for the next five months because we have to honor the lease. But the minute that's over, I just did a rent analysis. I can do a CMA on that. And these things should be written for, you know, 800, mm -hmm. all right, or whatever. So the first chance we get, we're going to bump rents, all right, which is going to increase the cash flow, mm -hmm. which means we may be willing to pay a little bit more for this, all right, if we're in a multiple offer situation. All right, so here's our raw data, all right? Each unit, triplex, you guys, how many units in a triplex? Three. <laughs> guys, this is the brightest class I've ever had. All right, I am telling you, you guys are way ahead of the rest of the groups I've had to teach this to. All right, okay, you guys got that. All right, so we got each unit renting for 550 a month. The landlord, because it's on one water meter, all right, it pays on average 75 bucks a month. We verified that. All right, we. Uh, we could call the county and find out what the water bill was on average. Okay, it's 75 bucks a month. Lawn care, they told us 75 bucks, and that seems reasonable to us based upon other lawn care that we've got, right? Um, 75 bucks a month the landlord takes care of. Uh, taxes are three grand a year. That's verifiable, right? And insurance is 1,800 bucks a year, all right? Just raw data, okay? Put the numbers in, it doesn't matter, okay? Fairly reasonable, all right? So that's our raw data. So just remember though, you might wanna write those down because we're gonna reflect back on that as we go through the formulas. Everybody got it? Yeah. Okay, 550 a month, 75, 75, 3,800. Mm -hmm. With me? Good, mm -hmm. all right? Calculations, calculate the annual net income. Well, first of all, before we can do net income, we gotta start with gross income, right? So you gotta talk what comes in, <coughs> all right, on the top line, and then we start subtracting and then we get left with the net, okay? Everybody with us? It's net income, like if you were doing your own business, is the same way, all right? Okay, 550 times three, because you guys are a bright class, you got that. Three units, that's 1650 a month is coming in, 12 months and a year. See, you guys, you got it. this is simple, all right? I got this, 19.8, that's our gross income. Everybody with me? Yes. Okay, pretty simple math. We're not gonna do anything, there is no calculus involved here. 
All right. No trigonometry, even though it's great. Do you know you could take, measure the shadow of a pencil, <laughs> right? And then based upon that relationship, if you measure the shadow of a pencil, and you can then measure the shadow of a light tower, and then say, I now know, because I can know the shadow length and the pencil length, I can now tell you how tall the, 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 the tower is without having to shimmy up the thing and drop a tape measure down. <laughs> There's trigonometry. See, look, you get bonus stuff all over the place, all right? Okay, it's just good stuff. Chris? Tangent to the curve. There you go. You got to love tangents, all right? Okay, 19.8, are you with me? That's our gross income. Now we got that's, that's cool, but we got to start subtracting, right? Because there are expenses to owning this thing called the triplex, right? We've got 150 a month. Remember, that's 75 for water, 75 for lawn care. All right, so we've got to annualize that, all right, because that's a monthly expense, 150 times 12. And then we have already annualized expenses, which is taxes were 3,000. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ta taxes 3000 and insurance was 1800 okay? So that's already annualized. If we do this, 150 times 12 plus the 4800 $6,600 in expenses, raw expenses there, okay? Okay, verifiable stuff. Vacancy rate. Let's say, okay, now again, in an ideal situation, let's say we were doing this on a 40-unit apartment complex, we'd want to see the rent rolls, okay? On average, how many of these 40 units are empty in any given month? Right? And after, if they have a long enough history to show you, they can come up with a vacancy rate, right? I chose, let's say out of our triplex, one of the units is, is, is vacant for one month out of the year. All right? Everybody agree in a triplex, there are 36 rentable months? Yeah. Right? Okay, because three times 12. Let's say one of them's empty, that happens to come out to 2.78% which, isn't math beautiful, happens to be one month rent for one of the units. Isn't that great? We're all just kidding. That is so cool. That's why I love math, right? Is it right or wrong? It's all right. All right? I mean, it, it, isn't that great? It, it's either right or it's wrong. Yeah. Okay? That's Joseph, my son, when the first he went to this uh, seventh grade, started uh, a school at this uh, uh, really cool school in, in Nashville. But as a seventh grade, wrote his, he's always gotten straight A's. So he writes his first essay for his literature teacher. Right, comes back, I mean, blood red. I mean, just this, that, did, you know, way, not enough detail, you know, just give me more, all this kind of stuff. So next time he writes this really, you know, okay, this, I got me adjust, all right, so he just comes back, blood red, way too wordy, right? Okay. <laughs> I was like, that would be frustrating for me. It's like, hey, look, dude, either the, it's the tangent to the curve or it's not, right? Okay, we can, you know, it's either right or wrong. So that's just, you know, but it's good. It's good for him to deal with that kind of stuff. <laughs> anyway, so 136, that's our vacancy rate. And again, expand the numbers. If we had a 40 unit apartment complex and it's an average rate of 3.74% vacancy rate, we can figure that out, all right? Repairs and maintenance, let's just say, let's factor in 10%. Again, don't use 10% as the always figure, but there is a figure, all right? whatever that is. Now you can ask them for that if they're a long-term holder of this investment property. They probably have some records that they could give you. All right, but um, if not, use some good kind of just common sense kind of things, right? Should okay. Have, a good amount of them should have for the actual property a P&L. Yeah, absolutely. If they That's have done it right, exactly. They're doing it right, they're using an accountant, all that stuff, they should have a P&L. I mean, the individual houses, I do know this for Wakeful and Invitation Homes. Yeah. Each house has its own P&L. Perfect, so it should. That's how, you know, that's what you should be asking for along with the rent rolls and all that. What's your P&L for the past year? If nothing else, guess what? Every investor, all right, even if they're not a corporation or whatever, um, have to file a Schedule E. Anybody who owned real estate before for investment properties, there's a Schedule E, all right, Schedule of Real Estate Owned, right? All right, the general one has three, attach more if you need more, right? And so you have these three, and it's a P&L, basically. It's all a Schedule E is on your IRS tax return, is a P&L. Here's your gross income, here's the expenses, here's the taxes, kind of runs it through. If nothing else, you know, that's where they say, I made no money, because they're trying to get right off as much as they can for the IRS, right? Then they start hemming and hawing. So well, let me see the Schedule E. So they're like, well, that's, you know, we kind of, you know, 
We said it was 2,800 bucks, but you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's really more like 28 bucks, right? Okay. Well, that's, well, even, that's even in our profession, you know, we're going to try and write off more than, you know. Absolutely. Then all of a sudden we go to get a mortgage and we're like, oh, exactly. yeah. all right. Okay. I get it. Right. And so you, you, you're right. You get you're, that's where you, you're going to pay the piper sometime. Right. Okay. Well, you got a, you know, a good, a good point. Like going back to where I was with that. I've been told by Frank Cotto, hey, you've got to make your taxes look awesome for next year. Income yeah. wise, mm -hmm. you're gonna to have to pay the piper that mm -hmm. year. But hey, you want the awesome mortgage. Right. You know, so hey, I might not be writing off my fifty five cents a mile, you know, on fifteen. It's what you got if you get it's, it's either your income or you don't have it, right? Or the opposite side of that is you know what? Let's just write off as much as we can, save up the money that we're not paying the government, and just pay cash for the thing. Yeah. Right? Or get a stated income loan, all right, because we've now got 40% to put down, so they just say, who cares? Oh, don't pay your mortgage, I don't care. All right, you're gonna put 40% down? All right, let me take it back and I'll go resell it for 100% and we'll be good, right? So that's why the banks look, think that way. All right, so I just chose this number, all right? Fairly reasonable, by the way, I've owned triplexes in anywhere, Florida, right? And that's, that's about a fair, that's a reasonable expectation, all right? Reserves, okay, let's take, these are small places, right? Let's say a roof, we can kind of get an estimate, it's gonna cost about six grand, all right? Six grand, and a roof should last 15 years. Are you with me? Okay. ACs for these, we're not talking, you know, we're talking one and a half ton units, okay? Buy them in bulk, all right? You should be able to get them for nine grand, okay, three grand a piece easily, if not less, all right? Nine grand, let's say it lasts on average about 12 years. So what I'm gonna do is, in a good investor, we'll start setting aside reserves for these good, for these type of things that we know are coming, right? You know what, by the way, if you buy your own investment properties, don't be shocked when the roof has to be replaced. <gasps> well, yeah, roofs don't last forever, right? Okay, ACs don't last forever, so plan for them, right? And factor them in to your analysis so you know what's my true rate of return and what is a good price to pay for this thing, all right? So, everybody agree that 6K divided by 15 years is 400 bucks? You can do the math, it's pretty simple. All right, six grand divided by 15. 9K divided by 12 years is 750. So every year, this is not a monthly amount, every year I'm gonna set aside 1150 bucks, kinda just to, so I know that I've got money to buy a new roof when I need it and to, to get new ACs in them as they come. All right, now, technically, do we get in and say, well that unit had to replace three months ago and this one was replaced eight years ago, right? And yes, you could do the analysis of that, that one unit's gonna need more sooner and so on and so forth. But on average, if you just keep rotating through for a long-term hold. Are you with me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, see these are all subtractions coming out of our gross. The net income, if I subtract this, minus this, minus this, minus this, <coughs> minus that, should get 9,520 bucks, okay? That's the true cash throw off, net operating income, cash flow, all synonymous terms, all right? People use them differently, all right? But they basically mean that thing produces that much money a year, got it? Now again, to Chuck's point, what is not in here? Mortgage, Mortgage. there's no debt service in there. Debt service does not have any type of thing to do with our cap rate analysis, all right? Now we, still, we don't ignore it, but it has nothing to do with the value of a home. Okay, by using the cap rate or the income approach. Remember those, the three different types of approaches. We have the comparable sales approach, we've got the replacement approach, and, or the cost approach, and we've got the income approach. Oh, that's tough, Mo. Oh, uh, you know what? Finally, we get to use it, right? Instead of just memorize it so you can get it out on the test and forget it, all right? Now let's re-remember it, okay? All right, 9,000, re-remember remember it. How do you re-remember? Like, but how you do? Because you remembered it a while ago, you forgot it, so you so you can re-remember. All right, good deal. Okay, all right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. How do you re-gift something? Hey, I got something for you. you want a gift card? No, all right. Okay. Value calcul calculations. All right. So this is pretty simple. You can get caught up in a world of hurt here. All right. You can just trust me, or you can do the math, or you can understand the whole concept of it. Basically, if I've got an investor that's one that says, hey, look, I'm not buying a triplex in anywhere in America because especially triplexes that rent for $550 a month, they don't come without hassle. All right? The people that trust me, I've owned triplexes that rent for $550 a month, each unit, right? Okay. And it's kind of calls, you get them on, you know, May 5th. Hey, Bob, I got rent. Where are you? <laughs> don't move. 
<laughs> right? I'll be right there. Okay? Seriously. All right? And I get there. All right? I'll meet you at the corner of such and such and such and such. And I get there, and they're like, I only got 520. I said, what? I had 550. Like, I said, it's only been 15 minutes. <laughs> I know. It's just burning a hole in my pocket. All right? Okay. Seriously. All right? So you get that type of uh, renter when you're dealing with that. So factor that in. Because of that, guess what? Those should, you should get a better rate of return because they're a bigger hassle. Right? Chuck? Or 10% for professional property management. There you go. Or factor that back into your cash flow and say, you know what? Let me take another 1920 bucks off of that, mm -hmm. off my gross, and pay this dude, um, you know, uh, Jerry Papa, to manage these things for me and just get him out of my hair. All right? Very valuable and not a bad idea. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Good point. All right? So, 10 cap, all you do, take the cash flow net operating income, divide it by the rate of return, a decimal representation of the rate of return. Everybody understands 10% is 0.10? Yes. Yeah, got that, good, okay. Do that simple calculation. When you divide by a number less than zero, you get a bigger number, all right? Here's where people start to glaze over on me. Well, we divided and the number got bigger, okay? Because you're dividing by a number less, I'm sorry, not less than zero, less than one, okay? Sorry. <laughs> Less than zero, you get a negative number, all right? But when you divide by a number less than one, you're going to get a bigger number than what your dividend or your, I forget what they'll call, all right? What, the, what you started with, okay? All right? So 9,520 divided by, you get, so what are, what are you saying here? Is that somebody's looking for a 10% rate of return on that triplex, says I'm willing to pay you 95 too. Yeah. Period. That's it. Not a dime more. Why? Because if I pay a dime more, I'm getting less than my 10% rate of return. Now, remember, they're buying not a property. They're buying a cash flow, right? Okay. So somebody else says, hey, you know what? Triplexes aren't that bad. I've owned them before, right? I'll do it. And compared to the 1.4% I'm getting at the bank or whatever it is, okay, I'll do it for eight all day long. Okay. It's better than a sharp poke in the eye. So okay? just so I understand, that's... So that's your net profit? That's your net operating income okay. is the 9520 mm -hmm. That's from the previous slide. We took the 198 or whatever it was. We subtracted out what all the costs. What does the percentage number represent? Just that is what our desired rate of return. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's our desired cap rate based upon, hey, look, because the assumption is without assuming there's any mortgage is that I'm going to take... $95,200 out of my account that I've got else invested elsewhere, right? And lay it on the table to buy this thing. The only reason I'm going to do that is because you've proven to me that it throws off $9,520. And so I am therefore getting a 10% rate of return on the $95,200 I took out of my that account. Does that make sense? Chuck. The one thing it can't, can't address, and, and that all that's yeah. accurate, yep. is if the property appreciates, if you hold it for five years, you have additional return based on selling it later. At Absolutely. All. We're going to go through that analysis as well, and that's exactly correct. By the way, how does an investment, a true investment property, appreciate? You increase the net operating income, right? Period. Or you find somebody to buy it for a lower cap. Well, lower, hang on. Okay, remember, somebody is looking for an 8% rate of return, just do the math, all right? Yeah, but just do the math. Yeah, but it's a, okay, 9520 $9, bucks divided by 8%, okay, is a bigger number, even bigger. The closer we get to zero, all right, the bigger that number goes, all right? So it's that same person, or, or that same property is worth 119000 to that guy or gal, yeah, but I'm just telling you, right? If you're selling it based upon the investment or the, the rate, you know, the, the, uh, the investment, um, what's the word I use for the appraisal uh, way we did it? Uh, income approach, thank you very much. Jeez, all right, 50 is a bear, okay? Okay, if I, if I sell it based upon the income approach and someone says I'm willing to do it at eight cap, all right? then they're willing to pay $119,000 for the very same property. Why? Let's do the math. If I took $119,000 out of my bank account, laid it on the table, and this year I got $9,520 back, 
I do the math, that's an 8% rate of return on my 119,000 that I invested. All right? Okay, Chuck. The part that always gets me buffaloed because I, I don't do this all the time. Sure. I can do all those calculations, but I don't know what an acceptable cash There you go. So, that's an awesome, awesome point. So when I say we don't do a market analysis, because quite frankly, let's say we're on a street full of triplexes. What most realtors do is say, well, the triplex two doors down sold for, uh. So this should sell for, uh. Apples and oranges, mm -hmm. right? What was the cash flow of the one two doors down? Mm -hmm. Now, if we can figure that out and see that it cash flowed 9,520 bucks just like this one does, which is rare, right? Okay, but it sold for this, then we say, oh, that one sold for a 10 cap. So there's where your market analysis comes in, right? Is that, and that comes from experience, right? And if you could gather the data on a sale that occurred three months ago and go through all the gyrations that we're going to here, right? And see that that one sold for a 7.4 cap, all right? And on average, the last six sales in the last eight months in this thing of this type of investment property in a one mile radius, averaged out to 8.4% cap, there's where your CMA is. Are you with me there? Mm -hmm. So we have to do an analysis of what is a reasonable cap rate. And, and to further complicate it, if we're in... No, we don't complicate any of the case. This is simple. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> if your expectation over the next five years is that interest rates are going to go up, yeah. that's going to negatively impact your... The value, theoretically. Theoretically, yes, but we, we're, what are we assuming? We don't care about uh, debt service, all right? Because we're gonna talk about people that are gonna pay cash for these things. Return on investment for comparable investments, right now, everything's yielding nothing. Uh, right, Exa oh, I see what you, interest rates like I can get at the bank. Yes, I gotcha, yeah. right, and you're comparing, that's a good point, all right? Yeah, the 10% cap rate. Yep. In your uh, experience, most investors want 20? Well, I want, I want 40, <laughs> all right? Okay, I want. <laughs> okay. What I really, I'd like a trip to Europe every year. I don't get it, all right? What I experience <laughs> is they won't settle for 10. That's possible, it depends on what it is. I know that's a good figure because right. it's easy to calculate. Right. All I'm saying is everybody wants 20. Okay, well if they want 20, right? Then you then, make more than 9520. Uh, exactly, but you take 9520 and divide it by 0.2 and you say, well, I'm only willing to pay you 47 or whatever that is. Right? right? So that, 47.6. What's that? Right. Yeah, well, either that has to double or this has to get cut in half. Right. right. I'm with you. The and it's, exactly, because the market's, I, the house that sold for $180,000, is a, that's a reasonable sale price, yeah, but I, I'm, I don't want that. I want it for 90. Well, okay. all right, okay. wishes and butts were candies and nuts, you know? <laughs> <laughs> We'd all have a Merry Christmas, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. You gotta read my paper. All right, very good. I get that, okay? But here's the thing, what an investor wants, I get it, but if you're dealing with an investor who's not realistic, all right, then you say, hey, that's great. I pat him on the hand, okay? All right, <laughs> nice to meet you, right, okay? Good luck with that, have a great day, all right? Seriously, because in today's market, here's the thing, if you're buying from another investor, the investor goes, uh, yeah, all right? I'd like to buy for 20, you know, 20 cap as well. It ain't happening. Yeah. Okay, not from me as a seller at least. I'm going to stick with my money and I'll just hang on to this thing. Right? Now again, somebody that's in jeopardy and in trouble and they're about to lose the place and they'll take whatever they can get, <coughs> find them. That's God bless you. Patty. Well, I, I had a, a, a kind of an experience with an investor and mm -hmm. I, I did it a little like backwards from, from what you did. Mm -hmm. And um, he wanted 500000 for his... Um, apartment right and um, so if you if you um, multiply that yeah 10% right you, you know you're gonna you're you're gonna get uh, 50 000. okay you say okay okay you That's so yeah be what you get your net operating income needs to be 50 grand 
Right. Is that what you're making? Right. Because if that's he goes, no, I'm I'm making eight thousand. Right. Okay. Then, then we're yeah. going to have to just look at it. You know, if you're making eight percent, then yeah. If right. You're making eight thousand, then obviously you can't ask five hundred thousand for the correct. Well, you can ask. You can ask anything yeah. you want, right? You just right. can't get. Yeah. Right. Okay. Based on a right. Rate. Right. Yeah. And yeah. And so you got to be honest on the other side as well. Easier to explain to them. Sure. From that angle. Anyway. Well, it does. And, and if you know, and you got to make sure your sellers, if you're representing a listing agent, right, or your listing, you got to represent your seller is reasonable in their expectation of what they're going to get as well. Yeah. All right. It's no different as far as what a buyer wants to pay for a property and what a seller wants to get for a property. I, you know, there really is no difference other than we've got to, hey, does this really make sense? At the end of the day, as we analyze this, does it really make sense? And is it reasonable, all right, based upon what you want to get and what you want to pay? Because And if we can't come together, then there's no meeting of the minds, and we know a meeting of the minds is called a contract, all right? And so we don't have a contract. We were never going to get to contract, all right, if we don't have a meeting of the minds. Everybody agree? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. We've had a, a little bit of success with a number of investors. Yep. Yeah. Um, not by focusing on the capital uh -huh. return on investment. Right. And so we, we, we say to them, look, you've got your money. We have some people out in New York. Uh, Chinese folks have businesses up there. Everything up there is so expensive. Yep. Well, we say to them, if you've got the money in the bank at half a percent, yeah. whatever it is. Yep. Uh, you can leverage that money 25% mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. Now, the cap rate goes out the window because mm -hmm. all you're tying down is 25%. Correct. We just bought a fourplex here on off Coral Way. Yep. Um, rent is $750 a month. Right, we for know, each unit. We know because we have other properties there with the yep. same investors, they can go up to $900 a month. Yep. Clean, you know, a little granite or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happens is they put a little bit of money down. Yep. They get what is what are now top rents. Yep. Even after paying the mortgage and so on and yep. so forth, all these other expenses, yep. their return on the little bit of money yep. is a very high percentage. Absolutely. You're looking 15, 20, 25 percent. Yep. And that sells them every single time. Check this out. Here we go. Because that's a very valid point. Is exactly what we do. Okay. But we have a starting point someplace, right? We've got to have a starting point of where we're going to purchase it because I don't want to pay a one cap, all right, even though it may cash flow because I've got a problem reselling that property potentially down the road, all right? I wanna sell it for a reasonable, or I wanna buy it for a reasonable cap rate, but once we do that and we settle on a price, and we can analyze, the cool thing is once you do this, it doesn't take long to do the math. Say, so, no, I did not wanna pay any more than an eight, all right? Well, we're gonna to have to, to, if you want this one, it's, we're gonna get all the way down to 6.5. If you do 6.5, you look at it, boy, it's more than I wanted to spend. Yeah, but let's still run the numbers on the ROI, okay? Mm -hmm. On the, the power of leveraging and see if you're comfortable with that, all right? So what does that all mean? Check it out. One last thing. Somebody else says, I'm only willing to do it unless I can get it for a 12. All right, this is heading toward 20, but not all the way there. All right? <laughs> They're only willing to pay 79,333 bucks for the very same set of triplexes. Okay, same thing, all right? Same thing that spits out 9,520 bucks a, uh, a year, but three different investors, three different re desired rates of return, and you get three different potential purchase prices. Yep. On the, uh, the expenses. Yep. You uh, figure the appliances are gonna go bad in a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. that's, I figure that's part of the 1920. Mm -hmm. I did the 10%, you know, repairs. Uh, what about a home warranty that's 400 a year? Not a bad idea. Not okay. A okay. What's that? Multi family. They won't do home warranties, won't do multifamily? Oh, they'll do each unit. Yeah, so. Right. Yeah, you can weigh that out. That's a possibility, all right? Um, tri okay, again, what are you buying, right? Triplexes in holiday, all right? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> all right? I had, I had A1 appliance rip and pull, whatever they were called, on my speed dial, all right? Okay, you know, it actually paid, I had 38 units at one point separate, you know, in, in triplexes, quadplexes, different type of thing. It paid for me, I took one, of, I found a triplex that actually had a detached garage and I didn't make it available to anybody and that was my storage you know, space. 
because I would just, you know, if I drive down the road and I'd see, a, you know, somebody selling their range for $87, I'm like, hey, I'll give you 42 bucks for it. Okay. All right. Next thing you know, and I just buy it and throw it in there, right? Because you never know. Yeah, but how can this one's black and this one's gold? And you you're paying five fifty a month. All right, you want matching appliances? There you go. All right, okay. How do you want them? All right, they even have stainless steel paint. Right, okay. And I can market it as that. Seriously, I joke. By the way, I made these as bulletproof as I could. I mean, literally. I mean, I had. I would buy. You know, 16 by 16 ceramic tile in, in by the gross, okay? If I found it on sale at Home Depot or Lowe's or something, I'd say, oh, give me everything you got, right? And I just put it there. Why? I would just well, tile. I okay. fraction dent center at the Sears Alley. Well, see, but I just, I, I tiled every. I mean, literally, tiled everything, uh, semi-gloss everywhere. Tons of tiles. Semi-gloss. What do you mean semi? I said, yeah, that, that little shiny paint. Yeah. All right. So, my, if I could, if I were going to build these things from scratch, you know what I'd put? In every unit, I'd put one of those little drains in the middle. <laughs> All right. <laughs> cover it with a, cover it with a, with a thing. All right. Literally. Okay, you're out. All right. I just throw like a five-gallon bucket of bleach in there. <laughs> All right, let it sit for a while. All right, just start hosing things down. <laughs> Squeegee it down the drain. All right, next in. Here we go. All right? Sure, yeah. Think think Taco Bell bathroom. Yeah. All right? Okay, you guys been to a bathroom at Taco Bell? No. Next thing, the ceiling is tiled. All right? Everything. Okay? They tile it all. All right? Just everything. Okay? That's just, you know what? Oh, I really like to get out of bed and feel carpet on my foot. Guess what? Go get yourself a remnant. I mean, the bedrooms are all of what? Eight by eight anyway. All right? Come on. All right? Can't cost you that much money. All right? Go to Lowe's and get a little... $49 area rug covers the whole bedroom. Okay, it's eight by eight. Okay, here we go. All right. I loved my tenants. They were great people. Right. 79333 bucks. Everybody got it? Okay. Dif same cash flow. All right, different. Let's say we settled on a 10 cap. All right. We decided to buy this thing for 9520 All my guys are wanting to talk or ROI, and I get it. You need to talk ROI with these people. So here's what we're going to do. Let's analyze what our monthly payment analysis might be. Because we know borrowers or investors don't when they want to leverage, right? Okay, it's the beauty of real estate. You can't leverage. You got a hot stock tip and you want to go, you think uh, Yahoo's going up this week, all right? Go to your bank and say, hey, look, let's invest 100 grand. All right, I'll put in 20, you put in 80, and let's go buy Yahoo. Yeah, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> What's the bank going to say? No. Uh, absolutely not. But you go do it and say, hey, look, you put in 20, I'll, I'll put in 100, let's go buy a triplex. We'll talk. Right? Right now it might be 25.75. Right? But we, I, trust me, it'll, it'll get there. All right? It'll get to 20 and 80 again. All right? Mm -hmm. That they're willing, the banks are willing to do. All right? So you can leverage your money. They believe in real estate because it's a, something that's not just paper, right? It actually has a proven deal. This is the best part. Okay, Warren Buffett said this. He, he got, Warren Buffett got accused, or not accused, he kind of took some heat back in the mid-90s because he missed the dot-com boom, yeah. right? Everybody else was investing. Oh, man, you're making, you know, you got to buy Yahoo because it's, you know, returning. People are getting huge returns. He never bought any of these dot-com companies because guess what? They had no earnings, all right? They had no earnings, zero, right? So if you do a P.E. ratio, which is how you're taught to buy stocks, right? You've got to be below 20 or, you know, by a P.E. ratio price over earnings, right? Well, when your denominator is zero, okay, Everything gets way big, like infinity, okay? Because when you divide something by zero, try it. You get an error on your calculator, all right? The calculator's doing all like you dividing by zero. So when you have no earnings, it's ugly, right? So he says this. He says some people buy a collector's item like a 1962 Corvette, all right? Hoping, and they buy it in 2000, hoping that in 2010 they can sell it for more for the intrinsic value of what somebody might be willing to pay for a 1962 Corvette. Warren Buffett says in one of his books, he says, I'd never buy the Corvette. He says, but I will buy a taxi cab. Why? Taxi cab can create cash flow, right? Okay, so he got accused from missing all that dot-com stuff. You know, it's like, hey, you wanna go buy stock in Zillow right now? 
good on you. Have at it. All right. They only they only they were excited because they only lost 227 million last year. <laughs> but that's way better than we were projected to lose 260. So they won. All right. So they were, hey, boy, that's a great thing. All right. It's kind of you know like our government. We're only 19.8 trillion in debt. We were supposed to be 19.9. All right. So we're just doing yeah, great. Okay. <laughs> All right. 19,040 uh, bucks. Where's that? 20% down. All right, we decided, we, we settled on a uh, 10 cap for this property, right? Everybody agree that 20% of 95.2 is 19,040 bucks? So that's the per, that much I'm going to really, because based on leverage, I'm going to take out of my bank account, all right? Principal interest on that, if we did a 30-year note at 5%, by the way, does investment property always carry a higher interest rate than a regular uh, single-family homes? Always. Why? It's a bigger risk, bigger. right? When I owned all those properties, if things went to hell in a handbasket, okay, I'm going to keep a roof over my head and my family's head, okay? Everybody else, fend for yourselves, all right? Deal what you want to do to my credit, but if things get really rough, all right, I'm making sure I have a, so I'm going to fight for, and they know that, right? So it's a bigger risk for the bank, so they're going to charge a little higher interest rate, okay? Not significantly, but a little higher, right? So 5%, do the... That just, you already know there's a financial calculator right inside our MLS? Yep. Okay, very good. Okay, so you can just go get that. Taxes were two fifty a month. Everybody agree? Remember, it's uh, $3,000 a year, right? So two fifty a month. Divide that by 12. 3000 divided by 12 is two fifty. Insurance is 150 because it was $1,800. bucks. All right, divide that by 12, so I get another 150 a month going to insurance. Total payment, eight hundred eight eighty four. dollars Everybody agree with that? Okay, just do simple math. Vacancy repair and maintenance reserves, okay, that was our vacancy rate, 136th, right? This was our repairs and maintenance, 1980. This was our reserves for uh, roof and AC, right? Add those up and then monthly, make that a monthly amount, so to add those up, divide it by 12, okay? 306.67 a month needs to go towards those things, all right? Are you with me? Okay, cool. So that adds up. To, oh, others 150. That's our um, water and lawn care. Okay. So I'm analyzing this from. I am going to get a mortgage. Chuck had to leave, but it, we, he'd be happy to know we're talking about mortgage now. So when you see him, let him know. All right. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Grand total. All these added up. This plus this plus this. 1265.51. Okay. With me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Simple enough. Return on investment, finally. Where's that slide been? All right, we get there, all right? True cash flow, 1650 is my gross income a month, right? 550 times three, that's a monthly income. Subtracting out the 1265.51 we just came from from the previous slide, right? Which includes my mortgage, my debt service is now in there, everything's there, all right? I'm left with, on a monthly basis, $384.49 a month. And that, count, that already figures in one of the units being empty, all right, for one month of the year. Repairs, reserves, all that stuff. Taxes, insurance, all built in there, okay? Now, I'm a firm believer that you don't buy anything and you certainly don't buy it on installments, okay? I.e. get a mortgage on it, unless it positive cash flows, right? Now trust me, I would be thrown out of the room if I were teaching this in California because they don't know how to say positive cash flow. Mm -hmm. I come from California, right? They just, you know, they like to buy the 1962 Corvette, mm -hmm. okay, hoping that, I've got friends of mine from college, right, that, oh yeah, I got this great investment property. I said, that's awesome, good, you got it in the investment game. Yeah, well, it's how much you, how much you cash flowing? Well, I said, is it positive? Well, I, it's going to be work. I was what? like, hey, gee, read the book. Because they hold on. Yeah, in seven years, it has to go up in value, right? Yeah. yeah. Real estate never goes down, right? <laughs> you know an investor never buys for appreciation? Right? You know, you buy a house because you're hoping it's going to appreciate at 5% a year and yada, 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 right? You know an investor? I seen on the cake. If that happens, and the only way a true investment property appreciates is by increasing its net operating income, Right? Or if things change so much that cap rates go down, okay, remember that cap rates going down is good for the purchase price, right? And they're, they're kind of inverse. There's an inverse relationship there. The lower the cap rate, the higher the price, right? So you want to buy for 10 but sell for 6 on a cap. That'd be a really good deal, okay? 
Ideally, then you also increase the net operating income and sell for a lower cap rate. Then it really starts to multiply on you and, and get really good, okay? But right now, and by the way, my California friends, not only do they not have a, they, oh, I'm only losing 428 bucks a month. I said, okay, I said, please at least tell me you're not at a neg am loan. Well, okay. You guys know what a neg am loan is? Negative am. Okay, you know how uh, ugly a, a, um, uh, 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 the amortization schedule looks when you look at it, mm -hmm. right? And you print out all 360 payments. You're like, okay, my mortgage is $2,284 a month. And the first month, $2.12 goes to principal. <laughs> You're like, what the, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, WTF, what just happened, right? Okay, where did that money go, right? It's going, it's like, holy smokes, right? It looks really good for the banks, so that's why they set it up that way, right? <laughs> In a negative amortization loan, do you, you know what happens? Your $100,000 loan balance, after you make your first mortgage payment, you look and the loan balance is now $100,800. It's going up. You're not even paying the interest on it. So they got a negative cash flow on a negative AM loan and they're just like, I mean, I said, dude, just take your money and you know, roulette wheels, so, so you do something, right? Got a better shot, at least you get it over with now. All right, put it all on black and see what happens. <laughs> all right, at least you know what, you know, let's, let's find out now. Forget this whole seven years to find out what's gonna happen, right? Let's just do it now. And so I'm a firm believer in buying positive cash flows even with the debt service in there, right? Because here's the thing, if you're an investor, it's not a good deal if it's losing money. Don't buy it on the promise of, it's gonna be worth. If you hear if you find yourself saying it should appreciate at, don't do it. Okay, everybody with me? All right, make that promise to yourself that you want. Just you know what? Uh, it's better to keep it at 0.25 percent interest in my bank account. All right, than to have negative cash flow. All right. Okay. Alternative use. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get, take this investor. We're gonna take this um, a foreign investor who lives up in New York. The prices are too high, and they come down here and they see these kind of prices. And they say, "Okay, what else are we gonna do with that 19?" Let's say, forget it. Let's say it was at two percent. Let's say things went up. Or Chuck asked that question. What if interest rates start to go up, and what they can get at the bank? Let's say we get to the point where you can actually get two percent on some FDIC insured, you know, investment at the bank. That's not tied up for 438 years or whatever they want, you know, like some type of CD, right? Something actually fairly liquid you can get your hands on. Let's say they've got it in there now. They're getting 2% rate of return. You know that 19,000, why is it 19,000? That's our down payment. That's, our, that's what our investment was, right? We, didn't, we bought it for 95,2, but we only put 19,000 out of our pocket, right? 19,000 uh, at 2%, they would be getting $31.73 a month, okay? Okay, so compare that to that. That doesn't look like a lot, but it looks a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we shifted the decimal. That's a good thing. All right, when you go the right direction, by the way. <laughs> to the right is good, okay? <laughs> All right, so we shifted the decimal on them, and that's a good thing. It's at least a 10% you know, increase in what they were getting before. All right, so compared to that, so you show them that. And the other thing you say, let's say five years from now, let me ask you this, do rents usually go up? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, fairly safe. Okay, can we assume it? No, all right. It would be better to buy this thing if I knew I was buying it for 550, knowing the first time rents, the leases are up, I could automatically go to 600 bucks a month, yeah. Right, they're under rented, so I know I can get more for them, so let's do it, okay, I'm with you. Right, that's, that's the, the way to do it. You wanna buy it with the 550 in mind, but sell it with the 600 in mind, okay, because you're gonna increase its cash flow, all right. If we did that and everything else stayed the same, all right, you can do the math, okay, but if we did the math, and by the way, I know the percentages would change if I, because like repairs and maintenance, I made a 10% of the gross. I left the 10% as 1920. So you true mathematicians in there, raise your right hand if you're a true mathematician, okay? I said, you raise your left hand, I caught that, I know. All right, you guys remember the right hand, left hand story when I taught? You guys remember that? Okay, if you haven't told it, I'll tell you real fast. So I was a student teacher, right? Well, actually my first year of teaching, so first year of teaching, I had to be a student teacher first, and then my first year, full year of teaching, they come in and they still evaluate you, right? So they get to send somebody in from the, from the university to come and just check you out like three or four times a year to make sure you're doing things right, you're following all the things. So they usually do that when they bring the principal in, right? So bring the principal in, they come in and review my class, right? I'm teaching, you know, 
fifth grade math to 10th graders, all right, okay? Um, so, it's true, okay? All right, teaching fifth grade math to 10th graders, we're going through this, you know, and all of a sudden, um, uh, they come back, and my class is, you know, well-behaved. I didn't allow for shenanigans going on and that kind of stuff. Um, and then my report goes, oh yeah, everything was great, Bob. The only thing, we, you know, I'd like to see more interaction, you know, uh, with the students. I'd like to see more engaged. Like, dude, I'm teaching fifth grade math to 10th graders, I mean, there's a reason why they're learning fifth grade math in 10th grade, but okay, I'll engage them. All right, whatever you say, all right? So the next time, I know they're coming back. They tell me they're coming back. So they know they're coming back. So I just made a deal with the class. I said, all right, here's the deal. I said, no homework tonight, all right, if every time I ask a question, everybody raises their hand, all right? They're like, okay, okay, okay. But, but what if we, I said, if you know the answer, raise your right hand. If you don't know the answer, raise your left. <laughs> all right? Okay? That's what you were reminding me when you raised your right hand. All right? Okay? So every time, all of a sudden, I ask a question, the whole class, shoo, 38 kids. Uh, every hand goes up, and I would pick somebody with the right hand. All right? And boom, we, we got, it, got through the class grade. They had no homework. <laughs> Teachers, oh, what a wonderful boy. What an adjustment. You guys did a great job. All right? And I was like, right on. Okay? So always get around. Okay. So <laughs> there's always a way, right? I tell my boys all the time. Time. They're trying to get, you know, I said, you can't con a con. All right, you're going to have a long life, man. I'm just telling you, you know, you cannot con a former con, all right, or a current con, really. All right, just kidding. All right, so anyway, uh, where are we? So $16.50 a month. If, we if rents go up by $150 a month, right, 50 times 3, we're going to increase our cash flow by roughly $150. So our, now our cash flow is going to be $534.49 a month, right? And if we went back to the first slide, or second slide, and went through all those gyrations again, adding instead of putting 1550 or 1650 in there, 550 times three, but put 600 times three, all right, that's gonna change my gross income and all that kind of stuff. So now, even if I sold it at a 10 cap, all right, if you did the math, all right, went back through it, it would be basically that 9,520 cash flow we were getting came out to $11,009, right? And so if I sold it for the same cap rate at 10, it, that same place is now worth $110,000 five years later, okay? That's just using the same cap rate, nothing else. Now, you, say, you said you can't assume appreciation. I didn't, I used the same cap rate. Didn't appreciate at all, but it did appreciate because I increased the cash flow, right? So what's another way to increase cash flow? You raise the gross or you lower the expense, all right? Or a combination of both and now you're in business, right? You make the net operating income look better, whatever that takes, okay? So now you got that. So that same thing is now, let's say five years later, hey, I'm gonna go sweep off four greenhouses and replace it with one red hotel. All right, I'm gonna take my six triplexes and I'm gonna go buy a 40 unit apartment complex. So I'm gonna 1031 exchange, sell all these, take the cash out of those, put it into a 40 unit. I'm gonna consolidate, you know, and go that direction, all right? There's a reason why I'm a monopoly, they do that, okay? <laughs> It's real life. People sweep green, four greenhouses off all the time and put one red hotel, all right? It's a better way to go, all right? Um, <clears throat> by the way, I mean, maybe you wanna buy a hotel. If you're gonna buy this, does this apply to this, if you were gonna buy this hotel? Mm -hmm. yep. They've got books, all right? And their books come out to a net operating income at the end of the year. And what am I, am I buying the hotel or am I buying the? Yes. Thank you, okay? <laughs> That's all I'm gonna, what am I willing to pay for a cash flow, all right? That's what it is, okay? 110,090 bucks, everybody with me? Yes. Okay, so far. Now, let's take a look at our ROI. The loan balance, and I look back at that amortization schedule, went down 60 months, all right? Didn't go down by a whole lot, we all know that, right? Principal's still pretty high, but at least it was lower because it's not a neg -am loan, all right? So now I looked at that, at that uh, amortization schedule and that property, or I still owe $70,345.81. That's a pretty specific number, isn't it? because that's what an amortization schedule does, all right? They, that's what the bank agrees to you do. By the way, that's when you're doing a rent versus buy analysis. Here's another question to ask people. Well, should I buy or should I rent, okay? Let me ask you this. When's the last time your landlord's gonna guarantee that your rent is gonna be the same for 30 years? Yeah. yeah. All right? The answer's never, right? Yeah. All right, but the bank is. What can, it's the only thing you can change on my P-I-T-I, T and I. You're okay. with inflated dollars. Absolutely, okay, it, it's right. It's go, you're going backwards, Good. rent's going up and my value of the dollar's going down, both things, right? And so with that in mind, that's another thing when you're comparing people to uh, rent versus buy, okay? So my loan balance is 70,345.81. <clears throat> Cost of sale, remember 110 was what we're gonna sell it for? 
They're going to come back to you and you're going to sell it to them, you know, 6% commission, plus doc stamps and title, about 8,254 bucks, all right, about. Okay, 6% plus I just factored in, you know, doc stamps, we do know what exact that would be. And title insurance usually runs about what doc stamps are, okay, somewhere in that range. So it's kind of a good point. So 8254 net proceeds, $31,490.19. That's after I got my money, paid the realtors, and paid um, my mortgage back, all right? So now I get a check for $31,490.19. My ROI, though, is really... $12,450.19. Well, why is that? Well, I walked away five years in the future with a check for $31,490.19, right? But five years ago, I walked in with a check for $19,040. So my true return is the difference between these two. Agreed? Because I got a check today for 31000 or five years from now, for 31490 but I walked in five years ago with 19040 so I can't count that as a return. It's the gain that I made, right? $12,450.19 is my true return so far, okay? And I'm going to divide that, by the way, isn't math beautiful? Let's say, everybody raise your right hand. Right hand. <laughs> All right. I'm looking. Math is beautiful. beautiful. Okay, I'm just telling you. All right. Our returns are going to be huge. All right. Return on investment. Guess what? The formula's in the name. Okay. What? My return on investment. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? All right. I think music is the international language. Math is the international <laughs> language. Okay. All right. Return on investment. Okay, so I take that, divide it by that, and I get a 65.4% rate of return. Not bad, but that's over five years. So we can't get too excited about it, right? It's, but it's better than, better, it beats a sharp poke in the eye. All right, divide that by five, and I get about an annualized. Now then, again, if, my, if I've got people with their Series 7 license in the room, that sit there and say, yeah, but the annuity value of, uh, the current value of money is not the same today as it was. I get it. Okay, there's some analysis we can do in there. All right, but let's just keep it rough. All right, that we're going to get about 13.% annualized rate of return each year. Not bad, right? So that's something to show an investor. Mm -hmm. Okay, but catch this. It gets even better because... For 60 months, I was adding $384.49 to my bank account. Remember that was the positive cash flow even after debt service and all that? Mm -hmm. After we paid the mortgage, it was making $384.49. If I added all that up for 60, mo 60 months, that is 23 grand. Now there's, yes ma'am. <laughs> But if you raise the rent, it would actually be more, right? It would be more. I assume that we raised the rent the month before we decided to sell. Okay. okay, that's kind of, but that's a very valid point. If you had along the way, halfway through, let's say two and a half years in, is when we raised the rent, mm -hmm. then yeah, that would change the numbers even better. Mm -hmm. Okay, but now again, people say, yeah, but you have repairs. Well, repairs, we already factored in, remember? Mm -hmm. 1980 20 bucks or whatever it was that we were putting away each year for repairs, kind of planning on that. You know, yeah, but sometimes they're vacant. Well, we plan for it. Now, again, after two years, if you say, hey, look, I got my actually averaging three units vacant right. on average a year, then adjust your numbers, right? Put that into your vacancy rate. You got to be honest, all right, about the numbers. Don't lie to yourself. Too many investors lie to themselves. Yes, sir. If you don't have any repairs. Yep. Save it up for next time because you'll have them next year. <laughs> no, I mean, after five years, sell right. the place, no repairs. Your number just goes up. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's why you're talking about home warranty. Right. But on single units, not in multiple units. Correct. Exactly. So, uh, very. dollars a year to cover your losses. I. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I agree. To totally agree. Totally agree. And if, they're, if it's covering AC, then you can lop off 750 bucks a year is not going to the, rep to the replacement or the, yeah, exactly, right? All possible, okay? So now we add that, right, okay, to our old return and check out where the numbers go. 12,450, that's the actual net positive gain we walked away from the closing with. Plus the 23000 we got all along the way for the last 60 months, adding up. A little. It's amazing how 364 bucks adds up, mm -hmm. right? 
60 months. Just ask the person who finances your car. They know. Mm -hmm. All right. What a little $542.16 looks like over 60 months. All right. Trust me. They know. Right. Okay. Add those. Divide that number by your initial investment of $19,040. Now we're talking 186.6% rate of return. Right. Over five years. Divided that by five to annualize it. We're talking about a 37.32% annualized return. That is what sells, right? No guarantees, right? Okay, all right? But we can sit there and say, hey, look, this is reasonable, right? Am, am I trying to blow smoke up your backside or anything here? Okay, I'm not. This is a legitimate thing. Trust me, every time I do this, I'm like, I talk, had a discussion with Jeanette. Time to get back in the game. We, we had liquidated all our stuff. All right, now we're getting hammered with taxes and everything else, and there's some tax advantage we're gonna talk about in a second. We, we've got one investor that uh, what we're doing with them is because they have a lot of cash. Yep. We're going and we're making stupid offers yep. on a cash basis. Yep. And then buying the property usually for quite a bit less. Yep. And then doing cash out refi. Excellent, you hear that analysis? Great point. Okay, because, oh, I don't want to worry about appraisals and all that stuff, but if you make a really stupid, stupid being good for the buyer, right, okay, offer uh, all cash, you take that cash, now you've got 100% invested, but now you're going to pull 80 or 75% back out, you get someone to refinance that thing after the fact, mm -hmm. all right, because the seller liked it when you bought it for cash, but now you pull out 75% to go ba add back to your kitty, mm -hmm. all right, go under your mattress, so the next time you find a really good stupid offer to make, yeah, right? You pull it out of your mattress and go make another stupid offer, right? And you're starting to replenish this cash flow all the time. Your commission goes down a little bit. Right. But you're standing with that, with that customer. Yeah, yeah that's, it's the, absolutely. You kidding? Now they're going to buy eight from you, right? By the way, just real quick, be careful when, you, when people walk into your open house. Oh, yeah, I'm a vester. I'm ready to buy. I'll buy 10 of these. So I need you to cut your commission and kick me back. A per, da, 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 okay, you know what? You buy nine, I'll kick you back on 10. Okay, on the closing, on the HUD statement, right? We're talking on the closing doc, right? Okay, that's, we don't kick back, we don't kick no back. All right, yeah, no guarantees, and we don't kick back, right? But we can give them, because be careful, we talk about this all the time, okay? Some people walk in and they're all hat, no cattle. Mm -hmm. All right? They wear a big 30-gallon hat, you know, a big belt buckle, and then you go check them out and there's no cattle. All right? Okay? And it's a Texas term, talking about all hat, no cattle. All right? Don't fall into that, all right? Make sure you verify these people are who they think, who they say they are, all right? And if once you do, though, you start working with them, you can sell multiple properties to them, all right? Because there's some other advantage. Everybody with me so far on this math? Yep. Okay? Remember, you can email me for the slides. I'll get it to you. Tax benefits. Don't become a CPA because you're not one. Unless you are one, then you can remain one, but don't become one, all right? <laughs> However... Uh, Residential real estate depreciates over 27 and a half years. By the way, anything four units or less is considered residential, right? We all learned that in class as well. Five units or bigger, there's a different depreciation rate. Commercial property still depreciates. It just doesn't depreciate as fast, which means it's a longer period of time. I can't remember what it's 30 some odd years, right? 39 maybe? I can't remember what it was. All right, 27 and a half years, which means this, that we'd have approximate, in our example, if we paid 95.2 for this thing, all right? Each year, out of that cash flow that the person made, net operating income, all right, not out of my pocket, but on paper, what I show the IRS, I get to write off about 2,700 bucks a year saying that's a paper loss because this property is depreciating. That's in addition to the hard things that I can verify, that I can prove. Like, hey, I did have to replace the AC and I did have to, mm -hmm. you know, re repair the, you know, damaged toilet and yada, yada, yada. In addition to that, on paper, now why? Let me ask, somebody ask, uh, answer the question, why I take the 27 and a half years and I only do 75,000 instead of the 95, too? Your loan, you put good, that Not there, good point, good point, but it's not there. We only to get to depreciate the improvement. So there, every, in, every property has a land value and a improved value, right? Okay. okay. So the IRS goes with the assumption that land does not depreciate, okay? And so 
People ask me all the time, how did I, I do my own on these? And when I did it, I just went to the um, tax, the appraisers, you know, sheet, and they always have a breakdown, mm -hmm. all right, of how much of it was, you know, for this. And I just used that. And my CPA always just said, long as it's, hey, look, that's very reasonable to say that's how we came up with our value of what we're going to write off. Okay. By the way, 27 27 a year, that's going to come off, and so it's going to lower your adjusted gross income, which is great when you're paying taxes, not so good when you're applying for a mortgage, mm -hmm. right? Because you're trying to, you know, now i got to get it back up. Just know this, that any good lender, and they all should know this, they, that's why they ask for all your schedules. I need your entire tax return with all schedules mm -hmm. because they will take your depreciation and add it back to your AGI when they're free because they know it's only a paper loss. Not Now, here's the other thing. What does that do? All right, when do you have to pay this tax? Anybody know? Sell it. Okay, when you sell it because it's going to be part of your capital gains analysis because what you're doing is lowering the cost basis of your purchase. Your 95.2 says, oh, you bought it for only 95.2 minus 27.27. Minus 20, so every year you own it, you're reducing the cost basis of it, but capital gains is usually, for most investors, a lot lower than ordinary income tax rate, okay? And I know we got a roll, so. This would be a passive loss, not a, uh, uh, under special, unless a special election were made. Talk to your CPA about that, okay? Meaning, a lot of times, if they're not a qualified investor, then they become, that, that it's a paper loss that just gets applied to future gains. Okay, it goes against future gains, but you can talk to your CPA about that. Yeah. That's what Trump did. Uh, well, and that's what a lot of them do. Exactly, right? He had that massive whatever loss of, he, exactly. Okay, and I'm going to write that off over the next so on years. It's a passive loss going against future gains. Closing thoughts. Learn to look at a piece of property as an investment tool outside of your normal CMA analysis. The only thing you're going to really, you're going to CMA on is what is a reasonable cap rate. Okay, based on other things I've sold. Investors, CMAs don't matter. They're concerned with cash flow, cap rate, ROI, and the tax benefits. That's what they want to talk about. And if you learn to speak this language, I'm telling you, you're going to win people over and sell them eight different pieces of property instead of one. Questions off the top before we let, we let everybody go? See, I told you I was a good math teacher. Look, you guys got this, all right? It's either that or it's so late you, you got to go to the bathroom. You're going to say, I'm not going to ask a question. I don't want to be that guy or that gal, all right, that keeps us here longer, all right? If you have anything else, email me if you want a copy of the slides. Look for it on FHR University. If you got any questions, oh, one last thing. I challenge you. If anybody will, go pick a property just to practice on. has to be more than one unit. Duplex, triplex, quadplex, start there. Pick a, pick a property, do all the analysis, and email it to me, say, hey, Bob, I took a look at this property, they're asking this, but I did some research and it should be worth that. I figured that the normal cap rates are that. Okay, da, 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 da. I challenge you. In the next, I'll give, I gotta put a time date on it. How many time between now and the end of May, right? It gives you plenty of time. If you do that and email it to me, I'll send you a $20 gift card to wherever you wanna go, okay? Because I'm a firm believer in implementation. You learning this and then walking away and never doing it again means like, ah, oh, duh. So, Okay, but if you go do it, all right, something's gonna happen. That's your homework if you wanna do it. I'll even pay you to do your homework, all right? Cool? All right, good deal. Got any questions, let us know. Have a great day.